Hello, this is Tom, and I'm going to give a demonstration of the order processing flow in Sage X3. Sage X3 has a very robust, very powerful order processing flow, and I'm going to talk about some of the main features that we normally use with most customers. I'm showing a process flow map on our, um, on our screen right now, and we can set up our price book, price list for the customers, and I'll show that in a second. And of course, we can put our prospects and customers in. One thing I'll mention for prospects, we can do a quote for a prospect, but if we actually want to enter a sales order, we have to promote that prospect to a full customer. So this is a good way to segregate your um, your customer list, or you don't have to put prospects in as customers to create uh, simply create quotes. We can leave them as prospects, which is a separate table, so I don't clutter up my customer list with people requesting quotes. Um, so kind of a nice feature to, to keep our customer list as clean as possible. So the typical flow in X3 is we create a sales order. Um, and sales orders can be created manually. We can import these. We automate this sometimes from EDI or from websites or or however we want to do that. A customer portal can push information in. But we get, and a lot of times it's entered manually. So a lot of times it's a manual process or at least an approval process. Someone reviews those automatic orders and, and, and uh, saves those or approves those or releases those so we can process those sales orders. But our sales orders come into the system, and then typically, if we're shipping product out, we're going to create a delivery transaction in X3, and the delivery kind of lets us um, determine what we're putting on a individual shipment to a customer. Ideally, if we're not back ordering any products, a delivery usually is all aligned items from our sales order. Um, but we can do multiple deliveries against one sales order, or we can combine different sales orders into one delivery. So we have a lot of flexibility with our deliveries. But typically what we try to do, or what's normally set up most businesses, one delivery comes from one sales order. And the delivery is kind of uh, the warehouse's responsibility. So if we look at this from a uh, responsibility standpoint, customer service representatives usually are responsible for entering, maintaining our sales order information. And then once we want to ship those, we get our delivery created, either auto, auto creating those deliveries. We can set up uh, tools on X3 to create deliveries for everything that needs to ship tomorrow. Or maybe we create all our deliveries on Friday for everything that needs to ship next week. Point is, we can automatically create these deliveries from our sales order information if we wish. Or we can do it one at a time. We can have our customer service people create the delivery record or warehouse people create the delivery record doesn't matter. Somehow those deliveries are going to get created and then the warehouse takes over and are responsible for the deliveries of pulling those products out of inventory, preparing the paperwork, the packing slip, picking tickets, um, bills of ladings, whatever documentation we need would be printed from the delivery document. And then when the warehouse is done with that delivery, once they validate that delivery, um, inventory is relieved and then we would create the invoice the sales invoice that's going to go to the customer and this sales invoice could be automatically generated from validated deliveries if we want to set up those rules or sometimes we, um, we create those manually just depending on the volume and who's responsible but that invoice someone's going to look at that invoice and that's our last option to change anything on the invoice uh, extra charges we want to charge our customer for freight or for handling insurance uh, any of those extra charges we want to track uh, making sure commission schedule sales reps are correct just making sure everything on the invoice is correct before we do that final posting because when we do that final invoice posting that's when we send the invoice to the customer and at that point we can't make any changes to that document so typically sales orders is customer service department deliveries is our warehouse and our invoices is more of our accounting or sometimes it goes back to customer service for a review to make sure that everything is captured correctly before it's being posted to our general ledger and the invoice is sent out to the customer but that's the typical flow sales order delivery invoice but we do have some options, some variations we can do on that flow, and I'm going to refer to the X3 documentation and kind of talk about the various steps. Obviously, we don't need to start with a quote of the sales order. We can start with a quote. We can enter a quote, customer approves a quote, we can convert that into a sales order, which gets converted to a delivery, which gets converted to a sales invoice. So this is the normal flow, typically. Um, we don't have to start with a quote, but you can. The other thing we can do in between the order and delivery, we actually can create a formal picking ticket. So we do have the option of creating picking tickets in X3. And just depending on the business needs, the warehouse size, the staffing, 
uh, configuration in the warehouse, we could create a picking ticket or sometimes we skip the picking ticket and just create the delivery and then we can generate both a picking ticket and a packing slip from our delivery. So it's depending on stacking and separation of duties, we can actually create a separate document for picking if we wish. Also, we don't need to go through that delivery process. This is typically more for service items, um, things that are not being shipped from our warehouse, but we could, we could actually do this direct invoicing even if there are inventory items on our sales order. We can go from a sales order directly to a customer invoice. So if we had a distribution warehouse where customers came, like, typically came and picked up our product, we might not want to do the delivery. We can do it on a sales order. They come, pick up their products, and we just create their invoice. It really depends on paperwork and who's doing what steps. and and what needs to be done, but uh, we do not need to create a delivery. We can go from a sales order directly to an invoice. X3 also does loan uh, orders, and this would be like um, loaning stock to your customer. So you can send stock to your customer, and sometimes that stock could be returned. X3 allows you to return that loan stock, but sometimes we also invoice that that loaned stock. So this would be more of a consignment inventory type thing, or maybe you're stocking shelves at a customer once a week or once a month whatever they've used or consumed you would replenish and then at the end of the week or the end of the month they give you a number of how much they consumed and then you go ahead and invoice them for that consumed product and then also generate another um, delivery ticket to replenish their on-hand stock so x3 does allow that and they call it the loan order flow and of course we can skip all these steps and go right into our customer invoice screen and create an invoice for a customer. So we have a lot of options in X3 of how we how we handle the sales flow and we always just model this or, or implement this to match your business needs. One thing I will mention down here is so we look at our customers and our product table whenever we're entering. It doesn't matter how we start the process, whether we start out a quote or create a customer invoice, we still look at our customer table, our product table and our price list. So no matter how we start the flow, we always will assign the same price price to a, a um, document, whether it started with the invoice or with a quote. We look at our pricing rules and then figure out what we need to charge that customer. So it's always the same, no matter what the flow is. Now I'm gonna come down and show kind of the steps behind the scenes. This is another, uh, the complete sales flow is what they call it. It's not so much the steps you need to do, but it kind of shows you what's happening within X3, all those steps that, uh, that are done within our ERP software to uh, handle the sales flow. So let me just talk about this a little bit detail because it kind of uh, gives you a better, better idea of the flow of data through X3. Of course, we can start with our quote, not required but we can convert our quote into a sales order. Now, at some point between the sales order and delivery process, we're gonna allocate stock or reserve stock to that sales order. So that can be done by an individual. They can go in and say, this sales order needs to ship tomorrow. I'm gonna to reserve stock or allocate stock to it. Or in X3, we can automatically mass allocate. Again, by date range or by any other rule we want to put in place, we can say allocate stock to these sales orders. And what that is a key for is letting us know if we don't have enough stock. So we allocate our stock to the inventories. If we're short on something, now we get dashboards, now we get alerts going out saying, hey, this sales order needs to ship next Wednesday and we don't have enough stock for it, we're in shortage. So the allocation is an important step and we have to really sit down and plan with each customer using X3 of when we allocate those sales orders. Um, it could be the day before, I mean, it could be later. If you're doing a make to order processing in X3, well, we're not gonna have stock available maybe a week before, so maybe we're gonna allocate the day of shipment only. So just depending on, on stocking levels and, and flow of inventory determines how we set up our stock allocation rules. And again, we can do this automatically or individually. Now, one thing I'll note, there's eight, eight steps to this whole sales process, and you notice that five of these already have tools built into X3 to automatically do these steps. So we can automatically allocate stock to the sales order. We can automatically generate delivery notes from our sales orders and or our pick tickets. We can mass validate documents. Uh, we can create invoices. So even though we have all these eight touch points, it's not something that you need to do. Typically, we would have two touch points in X3 on the sales flow. Number one, someone's going to look at or at least an approve an imported order or someone's going to enter the sales order by hand. So usually the sales order is a manual process of something at least approving EDI orders or web orders or entering orders from phone or from mail or from faxes. And the other thing that's usually a touch point for someone to get their hands on a document is the delivery, either creating the delivery or validating the delivery. 
So we can create the delivery automatically, but when I pull that product and put it in a box and then put it on a truck or on a pallet for UPS or FedEx or someone else to pick up, I would do a delivery validation to say, this is exactly what I shipped on the sales order. So the delivery validation is usually a manual process of saying, here's what I shipped today. So the sales order and the delivery validation are usually the two touch points that, that exist on the sales flow. Everything else on here can be done automatically by X3 in the background. Uh, sometimes we do turn every other step on automatically. Sometimes people like to, to be able to have an opportunity to look at documents before they get posted or validated or moved on. One example is the invoice. So we can create our invoices from our delivery validation. So we can create all those customer invoices. What some companies like to do is we create all the invoices overnight. So you validate a transaction today, tonight X3 will automatically create all those invoices. But we do not post or validate those invoices. So we give you the next day to come in and review all the invoices that are unposted, unvalidated, to see if you need to change pricing, if you need to add extra charges for insurance or freight or for this or that, make sure the sales reps are coded correctly, all those little details. And if everything looks good, then the following evening we can do invoice validation automatically. So we can set up different rules of how we process this flow to give you an opportunity to intervene, but we like to set up as much automation as possible and then you just handle the exceptions or we give you the tools to review and and possibly intervene if you need to intervene but if you don't need to touch a document we don't want you to have to go in and click a button a hundred times a day just to say post this invoice post this invoice if, if you're typically never having to change anything on those invoices so we try to automate as much as possible to make the system work for you and make it as efficient as possible so this is kind of the entire flow um, let me just talk about this we talked about stock allocation we have the option of creating picking tickets if if that fits your warehouse or we can just create deliveries and then we can print out a pick ticket packing slip and bill lading all from the delivery to give you the the tools to to get that order out your warehouse if, if that's what you need the delivery validation is when that delivery is all done and that is leaving your facility is typically when we do the delivery validation and that's when an x3 does the stock issue it takes that product out of your inventory and also starts making GL entries at this point, reducing inventory valuation, posting the cost of goods, and then it also does a pre-sales, pre-accounts receivable posting as well. But then we create that invoice, and then we can modify the invoice. We can add extra charges to it for freight, for insurance. We can change our pricing if need be. But then we post that invoice, and this is when the invoice validation is done. We do that final posting to the GL, and we do that final posting to AR and sales accounts at that point. At that point we're done with the invoice and it gets either printed and sent to the customer or we can email those invoices with a PDF attachment to the customers. So that's kind of the entire flow behind the scenes. Now let's go in and actually do this uh, in X3. So I'm going to come back out here and we're going to skip the quote step and I'm just going to go into the sales order screen. The quote screen and the sales order screen are almost identical. so. Um, pretty similar so we're just gonna look at the sales order screen but the point is on when I do a quote I have a button on there to convert that quote into a sales order but um, since the screens are similar I'm just gonna jump right into my sales order screen I'm gonna look at the uh, full the all sales order screen which has all fields enabled so these screens look pretty busy um, what those different entry transaction screens give me the ability to do is turn fields on and off for example, if I'm never doing projects or I don't have to foot sales reps on my fields, I can create a version of the screen that hides these fields that I don't want to see. So we can customize these screens very easily to fit your business needs, hide fields that don't need to be on here to declutter some of these screens. But let's go ahead and let's go ahead and enter a new sales order. I have to say what facility I am shipping from. I can give it a PO number. This is my customer's PO number. So type in something, sales order date who it's sold to, I'm going to type in a customer number, and this is for ABC Industrial. It's also being billed to this customer, and the same customer is paying by, and, and here's where it needs to be shipped to. This would list all my customer ship to addresses, and I can choose which one it's going to. I don't have a project, I don't care about my sales rep, um, taxes, delivery information, this is being shipped ground via roadway freight lines. Now these fields are set up on my customer ship to address and so they come in automatically and then I just need to change them if this is an exception. So instead of ground, if this was an expedited order, I might send this by air freight instead, something like that. But typically on my customer record, I want to set up as many of these fields as possible so I don't need to change them every time I do a sales order. 
And this information is coming from my customer record as well, whether I'm closing on filled lines, what this is saying, does it allow back orders, things like that. Can I do uh, one delivery per order, or can I do this, split this order over multiple deliveries, things like that. So I can set that up on the customer record, and then these fill in automatically, but I can override these on an order by order basis if I wish. Here's my customer terms, they're getting 30 days. 30 days from the date of the invoice. Here's my dimension uh, values, if I have any of those set up. But let's go down and just put our line item in. So I'm gonna sell this customer some pallets. So I'm producing pallets and I'm gonna ship them pallets. Um, and I'm shipping them from this location, my NA011 site. Here's my sale unit of measure. Now, one thing I'll mention is I'll go look at this product real quick. So this product, um, PNH, unit of measures, what I am doing is I'm stocking these in eaches or units. So I'm stocking each pallet as an individual uh, unit in stock. But what I'm saying is I can sell a stack of pallets or a pallet of pallets, if you will. And I'm saying there's 32 in that stack. So if I sell, if I sell this by a pallet, it's actually taking 32 units out of stock and I don't need to set it up this way. I could say my sales unit is units with one to one and I just sell it by units. But sometimes this lets you um, maybe give customer a better price or it just makes it easier. Maybe your customer is ordering by these, these boxes or cartons or pallets or whatever. It just makes it easy to do the stock conversion for you so you can kind of put the sales order in the same quantities, the same units that your customer is ordering by. So if I just want to sell these by each pallet, I would just change my sale unit and measure to eaches, and I can say I'm going to sell 100 of these pallets. It is, now right now I'm not, I don't have anything in my quantity to allocate, or I've set up the rules on X3 to not fill in anything, allocation quantities, because I can do this later, but I can go and say, go ahead and allocate 100 units to this sales order. I'm selling these for 37 cents a piece. I'm going to change this to $12. I don't have any discounts for this customer, and so my net price is $12. My cost is $2.20, and so when I save this line, it's gonna update my margin totals on this sales order. So my total sales value for this is $1,200. I had 100 units at $12 a piece, and then my cost was $2.22, and so my margin is $980. So X3 is keeping track of that for me and knows what that is. As I enter each line item, um, so I can go ahead and let's just go ahead and create the sales order. Now there are some extra charges we can put on here. That's in my invoice elements right here. So these are user definable list of extra charges you want to charge your customer. So I have a discount I could give the customer if I wanted to, freight amount uh, insurance. So discount obviously is a discount off the sales amount. Freight insurance would be addition. So if I'm gonna charge the customer $100, Go ahead and do that, save that. Now my margin total on my products is still $1,200, but if I go look at the total for this order, when I print this out, it's gonna add that $100, and it's gonna be a $1,300 sale to the customer. And once I save this, let's go look at this information. You can see the valuation down here. So the margin totals are my line items totals. The valuation includes all the extra taxes, extra surcharges. So the customer total is gonna be $1,300 on this invoice. So we've allocated uh, stock to this now. If I go back up to the top, um, you can see that allocation, yes, signed automatic. Now we can do signature approval on these sales orders. I don't have a turn down for this transaction. But we could set it up based on dollar volume, based on margin. If my margin is below X percent, we could require a signature. If the sales amount's over $100,000, maybe we need a manager signature or something like that. But we can create those rules for signature approval, and, and then this order would be placed on hold until someone with authority would sign this document. So this has already been signed because I'm not requiring signatures right now, so it's already turned on. So it's already, already approved. The other thing that didn't happen is credit was okay. This customer had enough credit, we could ship this order. If they didn't have credit, or if they were on credit hold, this order would be placed on hold, and then this order would be prevented from being shipped until, it's almost like signature approval. You can't deliver or invoice this order until the customer um, either sends payment in, um, they prepay this order, or if a manager releases this order. So those are the three ways if you're in a credit hold situation that an order could be released. If the customer sends a check in and pays on their account, then the sales order would be released. If 
I were to change these payment terms on this order from net 30 days to credit card or prepaid. So if I were to change this to cash and I entered a payment, then the sales order, even though it's on credit hold, would be released. So that's another way this can be released. So either customer makes payment on their account, they pay for the sales order, or a manager comes in here and they release this order. That's the only way that this order could be released. They're not on credit hold, so we can go ahead and release this. So typically we would go to the delivery and do the delivery next. Now we can do the preparation, and the preparation is the picking ticket. So that that is, uh, if we need to create picking tickets, we would click on preparation. I'm gonna skip the picking ticket step right now and just go right into my delivery. So again, sales order is usually done by customer service representative of your CSR department. They enter the sales order, they verify the pricing is correct, everything else is, is that's necessary is on here. And then um, when it's ready to ship, we go ahead and ship it. Now, one thing about the shipping is uh, the required date defaulted today, but let's say the customer really needed it on 715. On the customer record, we can also put the delivery lead time. How long does it take for us to ship this product to the customer? And let's say it was three days. So if the customer needs it on 715 and we have a three day lead time for delivery, X3 knows that we need to ship this on 712. So X3 is gonna tell us that we need to ship this on 712. And if we don't get it out on 712, it's gonna show up on our, our orders orders our late dashboard or we're going to notify someone that this did not ship on the 12th and now we either have to expedite shipping or call the customer and tell them it's not going to be there on time. So this is kind of an important date. This is when we need to get this out and so there's dashboards or rules built that allows us to manage this. The other thing I mentioned is uh, we can put the carrier on here, their delivery method. I kind of talked about that. We kind of set these up on the customer ship to address if we can and they fill in on our order each time. And uh, I guess that's it on the sales order. So um, I've already created my delivery record. Whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't create my delivery yet. Let me go ahead and save this. And then we can create our delivery. So when I'm in edit mode, once I've changed these fields, some of these fields get disabled, or some of these buttons get disabled until I enter those. Now we have a lot of traceability on the sales order. So let's go look at that real quick status so i'm going to click on status and this kind of shows me the status of this order i get to see all my items line items out there what my order quantity is what my allocated quantity is but i can see all the other transactions in the chain too i'd see my pick ticket number here i would see my delivery number over here and my invoice number over here so we'll look at some completed documents we'll come back and look at some of those but this gives me a one screen that shows me everything that's going on with this with this uh, sales order, all the invoices that got generated from the sales order, all the deliveries, all the pick tickets. So I can see all of that from this screen. The other thing I have um, is my journal traceability. And what this shows me is all the documents. It's kind of the same thing as the order status, but it kind of gives me a uh, graphical flow here. And we'll look at this one if we get this transaction fully shipped. We'll come back and look at those screens. So right now we're going to create our delivery. And I'm going to do this manually. Again, there's tools that would create these deliveries automatically for us. Um, but I'm just going to do the manual step all the way through to the invoice. Kind of walk you through each screen to see what you're looking at. So now the sales order is done. Now our warehouse is going to take over. And so we need a delivery for the warehouse. So let's go ahead and create our delivery. So I click on this. We'll use the all entry transaction screen again with all fields enabled. And the delivery is, I really don't need to do too much with it unless I'm not shipping the entire quantity. So by default, all the line items from the sales order come in. If I'm not shipping everything, I'll delete those line items. I can also change the quantity. So if I don't have 100 to ship, I can change it to 99 or 90 or 80 or whatever the case may be. And then also I'll just note too that if I'm not shipping 100% of the quantity, you can set up rules in X3 and on the customer of how much you ship that would automatically close the sales order. This is usually for bulk shipping, like if they order a truckload of a uh, product, you know, 24, 24 tons, and I ship 23 and a half tons, I'm probably not going to ship that last half ton. So you can set up rules in X3 that if I ship 95% of the product, that this open sales order lines get closed. And typically for bulk products that I'm shipping to customers or selling to customers, I want to set up those rules so I don't have fractional sales order amounts left open that I'm never going to actually ship. But in this situation, we're going to do 100%. So we're going to leave this at 100. They ordered a quantity. We're shipping. They ordered 100. 
we're going to ship them 100. Now at this point is where I start maybe doing some documents too, and again these can be automatic, but um, I'm going to go ahead and save this. One thing I can do is my packing slip from here. So if I'm going to ship 100 units to the customer, I might want to put a packing slip with the shipment that goes inside the box, inside the carton with the shipment, whatever the case may be. But I can go print on my record, and I can have different versions of my packing slip. Um, we have a lot of different versions of these reports. I'm just going to do a preview instead of email this to the customer. So I'm going to say print. See all these document items are filled in, so I don't need to touch anything. It already knows that it's just going to print this this delivery number, so I don't have to change anything. So we'll look at this delivery once it's done printing. So it is done. So here's our packing slip. We're sending 100 of these pallets. Here's my item number. Net prices are on here as well. I have my gross weight, net weight, number of parcels if I have that information filled in. So there is my packing slip. Also, we can generate bills of ladings from these deliveries. So if I can go click on my bill of lading, it'll create a new bill of lading document for me. And now typically I would set up the bill of lading by default prints by freight class, packaging, and the national manufacturer freight classification. So I would set these values up on my inventory items. x is going to grab all that information and summarize all the line items so I have my bill of lading by these. And so this is typically how it prints the bill of ladings. Sometimes we change this so each product from the delivery is a separate line on the bill of lading. We really don't care how you want to set up the bill of lading. It depends on your business and what your customers expect, but, but we can modify this if need be. But this is kind of grouping or summarizing our lines from our sales order onto our bill of lading. And then, of course, we can print our bill of lading. Uh, we have our carrier, our delivery mode, our packaging details. Here's our content. So we have all that information. We have our weight and our volume all filled in from our item master. Uh, it allows us to calculate that. So I'm going to go ahead and create our bill of lading. Here is our bill of lading number. Whoops, bill of lading 17. And it's referring to, to our delivery number there. So let's go ahead and create our bill of lading and print that out. Again, it's filled in our bill of lading number, date range. We don't have to do anything other than hit print. And we'll see a preview of our bill of lading. This is just the standard uh, straight out of the box bill lading from X3, where we're shipping from, where we're shipping to. And then we have our information down here, our freight classifications, packaging types, etc., etc. So that is our bill of lading. So typically that's what we do from our delivery document. We're going to verify what products we're shipping. We're going to maybe create our packing slip, our picking ticket if we need one. Um, we're going to create our bill of lading if we need one. So we enter all that information. And the final step is we're going to do a validation. Uh, one thing I'll note is we have the pro form button here. We also have the pro form button on the sales order. So if you're shipping internationally and you need to put a valuation document or some kind of invoicing document in there, we can generate that pro form invoice from a sales order uh, or from a delivery. So typically if we need to send it with the shipment, we would create it from the delivery. Sometimes you need to email that to customs or to your customer, that pro forma invoice. Maybe if the customer has to wire funds, they need to give their bank that uh, that pro forma invoice then so the cust the bank has proof of what they're supplying credit for. And then you can you can send that pro forma invoice from the sales order or we can generate it from the delivery. So at this point though, let's say this document's all done. Um, we will go ahead and hit validation and then we will be done with this delivery. So up to this point, we really haven't done anything of updating the core system. We haven't done any GL postings. We haven't done any inventory postings. We've allocated stock, but that's just a reservation against stock of reserving stock. It doesn't actually decrement, decrement our inventory. In fact, let's go look at that real quick and let's talk about um, um, stock by site. So here is our inventory at our Nova Scotia plant. And you can see we have the internal stock, 1,717 units. And then we have 297 on sales orders. But you see, we only have 175 allocated. Not all our sales orders are allocated. But if we look at our on-hand stock, 1717, minus the 175, if my math is correct, that should be 1542. That's our available stock. That's our free stock. So what X3 is saying, available stock of 1542, 
That's our unencumbered stock. That's things that have not been allocated to sales orders. And that's really usually where we have a discussion, a detailed discussion of how the allocation rules should happen in X3 because you may not always want to allocate to every single sales order. If you enter a sales order and a customer is saying that they don't want to ship that product for two months, you probably don't want to allocate and tie up inventory for two months to a particular sales order. That's why we kind of run those mass rules depending on when you need when inventory is available and how long you want to allocate inventory before it actually goes out your door. Usually it could be next day, usually it could be the next week. So sometimes we would run something every night that says for the next seven days, any sales order that's scheduled to ship allocate stock. And that kind of gives us our visibility of sales orders that are going to be short, that we don't have enough inventory for, or something that maybe we're still manufacturing or maybe we're waiting for a, a delivery from our customer, but at least it puts it on our radar that 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 sales order is going to be um, um, pretty tight inventory getting in, getting unpacked, put away, getting ready to ship out to the customer. So we kind of kind of use those allocations to kind of warn us of any potential issues or critical issues based on based on your inventory flow and and turnaround time and whatnot. But anyway, that is kind of our available stock, internal stock, allocated stock. That's kind of how X3 is using those values. So we're back on our delivery now. So now we're going to validate. Now when I validate, X3 is going to reduce our on hand and our available stock, and it's also going to reduce our allocation. So let's go look at those numbers again real quick. 1542, 1717, 175. Now if we go ahead and validate this, those numbers should be updated. Now if we go look at our stock by site, those numbers should have changed. Our allocated internal is now down to 75. Our internal stock went from 1717 down to 1617. Our available stock did not change and it should not change. We still, this is what we have free. All we did was reduce our internal stock by 100 and our allocated stock by 100. So we still have 1542 available because we've already allocated to that delivery before we validated. So avail available stock does not change. Okay. And of course, uh, I think this was 297 before on sales orders. Now we have 197 available, or 197 on sales orders. So now we're done with this delivery. Now the last step is to create our sales invoice for the customer. And again, this could be done automatically. So every night we could look at all validated invoices or validated deliveries and automatically create those invoices. Or sometimes um, it's done manually. There's no point of doing it manually because typically the invoice is going to be in a match for the delivery. What's ever on the delivery is going to go to the invoice. Now we do have the ability in X3 to do um, combined invoicing. So once a week we could create an invoice for a customer and we pull all their validated deliveries or once a month or, or whenever you want to do it. So we do sometimes set that up, but most of the time it's usually a one invoice for one delivery. Sometimes, though, your customer requires one invoice for the entire PO, and we can set that up on the customer, and that kind of flows through some of the rules on the sales order, some of those fields we are looking at. We could say one invoice for the sales order. So we might have, if we had two deliveries for that sales order, we might actually take those two deliveries and put them into one invoice. And that's kind of when we get into this in delivery selection. We can actually have multiple deliveries out there. We can bring them into one invoice, then give the invoice, want the customer one invoice for their PO. So sometimes we see that as well. But the typical flow is one invoice for one delivery. The customer is going to do a receipt and they're going to get an invoice for that receipt that should match exactly. So it really depends on your customer's requirements and what your business processes are when we create these invoices, but uh, the typical flow is one invoice for one delivery. So here is our invoice, um, and we have the 100 pallets on here, and same same price, $12 per pallet. Remember we added the $100 for freight? Well, this is where we can start doing some extra f charges too, and that's what I was mentioning. You might wanna look at this. You know, our freight was $100, but uh, we had to expedite because the customer asked us to rush it. So rather than the normal $100 freight, maybe we're going to charge them $200 for freight. This invoice, as long as it's not posted yet, gives us the ability to go through and make these changes. We can go into pricing and say, well, we charged them 12 but they've been a good customer. We're only going to charge them 11 So you can go through and change whatever you want on this invoice. Again, if you have permission to change the invoice. 
but then at some point you're going to post this invoice and when I post this that's kind of the point of no return at that point I can't make any changes to it X3 is assuming that once it's posted the invoice is going to be printed or emailed to the customer and they're going to get that legal document that they need to pay and so they don't let you make any changes to the invoice at that point at that point if you want to change the invoice you have to do a credit memo debit memo for extra charges or or to reduce charges so let's go ahead and post this invoice and that'll be the final step this is now validated and we're done with this invoice we can zoom in and look at our GL postings for this document which is really just a uh, final uh, GL document uh, showing sales and AR being hit now it takes a second even though I posted this there is a batch process in the background actually generating those uh, GL postings so, so sometimes it takes a minute for that that final posting to uh, actually push into the GL but it should pop up in a second here I did post it um, and we'll look at that later let's go ahead and close this invoice I'm gonna step back through so I'm kind of drilling through from sales order to delivery to invoice as I close these screens I walk back to my sales order so I can go all the way back to my sales order so here's my sales order we started with and a couple things I showed before that didn't have any valid data on it but let's go look at this now let's look at our order status window here was our product that we shipped to the customer this line is now closed because we've shipped everything here's our delivery number here's how much we delivered here's our invoice number and our invoice quantity so this is kind of a, a basic one line but obviously we have four or five lines or if we had multiple deliveries multiple invoices would be a little bit more interesting so that is our order status window we also have our journal traceability which will have good information now so here is more of a tree view of the whole process so we have our sales order 11 oh i'm sorry, 110335 we had our delivery 110060 and we had our invoice number 20 and we have our journal entry here too so we create our journal entry then we have the open item that is really the receivable from the customer as well so we have all these documents in here and then our journal should be created now yep here's our general i couldn't get this from the invoice screen but now it's all prepared and ready so here's our gl posting that it made our sales accounts that were hit 41 100 um, here's our extra freight charge hit a different gl account and then we had our ar account and some other stuff going on here too so our journal entry is created so the nice thing about this journal traceability is i can jump into these various screens so i can use my little action icon there I can go click and go look at my invoice from this sales order so typically when you're looking up um, if you have any questions from the customer or whatnot you can go to any one of these screens sales order delivery invoice you pull up the document you can use that journal traceability and jump around so I can go from the sales order and go look at the invoice and say oh yeah we did charge you two hundred dollars for freight and one thing I'll note too is what I like using if you do things like that of changing default options you have this little comment window over here and if I would have changed that freight charge over the customer's normal freight, I might have gone in here, put a little note, charge $200 because the or customer asked for expedited shipment or something like that. These comment fields are internal comments. This is just a standard feature in X3 on any document. I can do this little internal comment box. But that's a nice way to, to annotate uh, documents with your notes so that if someone's looking something up, they can look at that. There's a little red dot or green dot that will show on that icon that tells you there's data out there you can go look at. So I use that quite often when you're overriding default documents so that when people look at this or research this further down the line, they can see why something unusual was done or why default behavior was overridden. So I close my invoice, I'm back to my journal traceability. I close this, then I'm back to my sales order. And then I'm back at my sales order screen. So that is kind of the sales flow. We did a sales order, we did a delivery, and an invoice. Now we did all these manual. As I said, we can create the invoice automatically, we can create the delivery automatically, so we can do a lot of those things automatically. And typically what we do if we're creating the deliveries automatically, we would probably generate some kind of packing slip or picking ticket along with that delivery. So when the warehouse comes in, they're gonna grab that paperwork off the printer and then go and start pulling that product for shipping. And then they know that that's how they know what deliveries they need to look up and validate. The other thing that can happen is that we can use the ADC or the automatic data collection and they can actually use those 
those guns in the warehouse, rather than printing out paperwork, they use those devices which have barcode scanners on them to, to be directed what to pick and what the delivery number is. And they can do all the validations and, and whatnot directly from those um, handheld devices and not have to touch these X3 screens at all. So that is built in to X3 as well, those automatic data collections, those ADCs. And just to show that process real quick, I'm going to bring up our inventory warehousing control screen. And you can see all these little RF buttons. These are all the um, all the functions in X3 you can do with those RF scanners or those uh, barcode scanners. Purchase receipts, put away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Picking um, picking location transfers or um, sales directed pick is what we're talking about right now. Directed pick would be those delivery validations. A couple more things I want to go through real quick. Um, order management. So we're going to use a inquiry screen to look at our sales orders. So obviously one thing you always want to do is track what sales orders are open. So there's a lot of different ways to look at that in X3, but one thing I can do is I can use this order inquiry window. And I can come in here and I can turn off certain things. So I can turn off closed orders. So I don't want to look at closed orders. This is only going to show me not closed orders. I hit search. Here's all my open sales orders. I can look at all sales orders that are not signed. Search on this. Everything is signed. So everything has been uh, approved. So I'm not waiting for signature approval. This might be something I look at to say I might have to go nudge my manager or, or someone say, hey, you got 25 orders out there that need to be signed. Uh, can you get that done today or something like that? So these order inquiry screens just give you ways to go look at different things. I can search on customers, um, a lot of different uh, options to actually go in and filter and build this list. So this is a nice, nice screen. A couple of things that are kind of nice on this. So here are all my open sales orders. Well, I can go look at my customer chart. A nice little graphical view. Here's all my open orders by customer. So customer NA009, which is who we entered our sales order for, they have $96,833 of open sales orders. NA007 has $47,000, etc., etc. So I can show this in a list or in a graph. Sometimes I might show this in a list, and then I would export this out to um, Excel or something like that. So there's a lot of different ways to uh, and I click on this and say export to Excel. But kind of a nice little graphical visual indicator. Another thing I like is um, uh, the status list. Now this isn't showing me the greatest information because I don't have a lot of things in deliveries or deliveries not invoiced. But this shows me that entire order flow. I'm using a color-coded chart to show me by day, well this is by month, you know, what my buckets are. And obviously I'd rather not have a lot sitting and deliver not invoiced because what that means is I've shipped the product from my warehouse but I haven't sent the invoice to the customer yet. So I kind of use these dashboards to make sure that everyone is doing things on a timely basis and I have a lot of things sitting around and in process. So um, you can see right here we have $33, that's a delivery in process. Every, we don't have anything sitting at delivery not invoiced, so <clears throat> and then everything that's been invoiced has been posted, so that's good. But these charts, these graphs, kind of informative, kind of help you manage the business and see what's going on. So there's a lot of good information out here that you can use once you start using X3 for the sales order flow. One other thing I'll talk about, or actually a couple more things, let's just review this real quick. We can also create, uh, whoops, quote and order process. We also can create sales contracts, which are like blanket sales orders. So we can go in and enter a sales order. If a customer is going to order um, one product over a long period of time, we can go ahead and enter that into the system. I won't cover that right now, other than to say we can handle that. So they might, we were selling pallets, we sent, sold 100 pallets to a customer. Well, they might have a contract that they want to buy. 25,000 from us this month so we can enter that sales contract and then what we do is we do delivery request against that sales contract so every month they might have a release so that was our sales contract delivery request that we can generate the other thing i did want to talk about though because it's a powerful feature and usually most everybody using x3 for distribution for sales order flow uses this is the price list so there's a very robust very powerful price list um, tool in x3 so let me just give you an example of here's some of our and my demo data. Here's all the different price lists I have set up. A uh, very powerful tool that you can generate what price list you want to use. So typically what we do is we might have a customer product price. This would be if you offer a contract price to a customer or have distinct pricing for a customer, you might use this price list. 
So when you create these price lists, you can have as many price lists created, any combination of fields. You can grab any field from the customer, from the product, or from the sales order. And then we, um, then you would actually go ahead and enter, enter the details for those pricing. So let me just give you an example, customer product price list. So here's an example of a customer number, a product number. And then if I come over here, we actually can do quantity tiers if we want, and then the price. So for this customer, for this product, NA0, for this customer, for that they order this product, we're going to charge them $52.62. If they order product FIN, let me make this a little bit easier to see here. If customer NA003 orders product FIN902, they would be charged $53.90. So customer product prices, usually if you negotiate with a customer to sell them a certain set of products or maybe all your products at certain prices, we can load these in this price list. And one thing I'll mention is that we can import, export these prices to Excel spreadsheets to make it easy to maintain these things. So if you want to export this entire price list to Excel, you can go through, maybe apply a 5 or 10% price increase, load this back into this T20 price list. So we can, we can facilitate some of those. Uh, updates and whatnot. So this is a customer product specific price list. We give it a validity date range. This is valid for 2018. Here is our 2019 price list. And so we can set what dates these are valid. Now, sometimes you might have a product that's slow moving. Maybe I'm gonna go in and do a special price for a product. Well, that might be just a product price. So maybe it's a certain price for a certain period of time. So let's just create a new price list. I can say for the next 30 days, Oops, let me create a new one here. I'm gonna say for today, I'm gonna just do minus one. For the next 30 days, product uh, PNH is going to be sold. The unit price is gonna be, it was $12, let's say it's gonna be $10. And so this price will be valid for the next 30 days, then I'll revert back to its base price. Um, so that's just how you enter a price list very simply. But the point is you can create as many of these price lists as you want, but what you do is you assign these all a priority level. Um, and the priority level is how X3 is going to start looking through these price lists. Now we the two price lists we looked at just now were specific product prices, but we also can do discounts. So in this situation we have on the customer record, we have stat groups. And so we're saying if this customer is a 700 group, they get a 5% discount. At discount one, discount two is 2%, and then freight is a 5% increase, and that is based off of base price. So you set up these price lists, and this example is more typical. I'm not doing two different price levels. I just have a discount one. So if they're a 200 group customer and a 222 subgroup, they get a 15% discount off of list price or base price. The point is we can do specific product pricing. We can do discounts that get applied to the uh, to the order. So let's go ahead and actually put one of these price lists into effect. So let's go look at um, my customer first of all, and I'll show you what those stat groups are. So I'll bring up a customer and we want to look for group 220, 222, and we're going to do a 15% or we want to enter a sales order and see that 15% um, applied. So we're going to look at ABC Industrial, the NA009 customer, which we were using before. And I'm going to go find their stat groups. So that's a 400, 770. So these user, these stat groups, these groups one, two, three, they're user definable. And typically we rename these instead of group one, it could be customer type. Group two could be a specific industry. But they're, they can be hierarchical as well. So group one can have a, um, so if I choose wholesaler for this 400, um, and then I would get my subgroup two would only be related to those 400. So I can have different hierarchical uh, lookups if I wish. So if I change this to a 200, I probably would get a different list of this, yes. So. I have these 200, so say this is a key account, 223. What was my price list discount? 222. So I want to make this 222 retailer. So this professional retailer. Again, these are user definable groups, um, user definable values within those groups, and you can have up to, I believe, six uh, groups per customer. So this is more for reporting, applying discounts, things like that, however you want to use this, but this is built into X3 to let you 
build how build these groups however you want to set those up. So now we have our customer NA009 is a 220, 222. Now if we enter a sales order for them, um, I should use that pricing, but I have to set up my ability date range first of all, otherwise we won't get any data. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do this. I'm gonna say this is good for the next year. 220, whoops, 200, 220, there's a retailer, 222. We're going to say they're going to have a 15% discount, and let's say we're going to charge them 3% for freight. Go ahead and save this. Well, here's our price list, and this is valid for 2021. And now if I go in and enter a sales order, make sure I save that customer record. So I have two tabs going back and forth on. Actually, change my customer record. I'm going to go back in and look at my customer, make sure I save that NA009. NA009, go down to the management section. I did save it 220-222. Just wanted to verify that that is set up correctly. I should verify my price list because maybe that's what it was complaining about. It said something was not saved, so I just want to verify that I created my price list record and that was a discount by customer strategy group. Yep, it is there for $15. One thing I do notice is my default currency there was euros, so I'm going to change that to USD. Close that. Now we're back on our sales order. Choose that customer again. Let's just go right down to our line items. PNH. Let's do 100 of those again. And there's our discount that got pulled in. And so there's our freight charge. And so there is our net price. Now one thing I'll note is that um, when I set this up, we're selling this by pallet. So let's start over again because our list price before was $12 because that was per unit. When we said there was 32 pallets per pallet, it's multiplying those together to come out with that uh, $300 price or whatever it was. So I'm going to change this back to, uh, oops, I erased my whole order. Let's start over real quick, NA011. NA009 is our customer. We can skip all the way down to our line items, PNH. I'm going to ship this in units instead of a group. Uh, let's do 100 of those. And my pricing should fill in automatically. So our gross price, 1181, 15% discount, 3% tax. And so our net price is $10 a piece. So the twelve dollars, so eleven eighty one minus fifteen percent plus three percent, it's ten eighty. And now our margin for the same quantity is seven eighty seven. Before it was nine eighty, but now we're giving them a basically twelve percent discount because of the price groups. And so I can come over here and I can look at my price explanation, and it'll show me what it did. So it said the gross price or the list price was eleven eighty one. It gave them a discount of fifteen percent and then they added 3% for freight. So this kind of explains how it's applying those various price lists. And one thing I'll mention on the price list, I don't think I mentioned, you assign each one of those a priority, and next week starts looking through those priorities until it finds a match. Once it finds a match, it stops. So typically you would have your, biz, your biggest discounts first. So the price list are searched by that priority code and they're assigned, or when X3 finds, finds a match in a price list that stops at that point and uses that price for the sales order. So when I flip over, let's look at the definition of these price lists. So here are all my price lists set up. You can see here, I, here's my priority codes for those. So when I sort this by price list, this would be the order that X3 is searching through these price lists. So it goes through um, these until it finds a match, then it'll stop. So I have 40s, I have a bunch in the same category. So in the situation where I have things in the same priority level, X3 actually would search all of these 50 uh, priority level price lists 
then it would find the lowest price within all those and apply that lowest price to the sales order. So this is where I create or set up the criteria for each price list. And this is where I was mentioning where I can pull in the different fields. So for this price list, customer product price list, I'm looking at my customer table and pulling in my customer number and my item master and pulling in my item number. And that gives me my customer's product specific price. I'm doing this discount by customer strat group. I'm pulling in those codes from my uh, BP customer table. So you kind of have to know the data dictionary to set these up. But the point is I can create these price lists. It's a very powerful tool that I can use any field from my customer table, um, um, item master. So here's all the tables I can pull in, product sales information, business partner, business customer, et cetera, et cetera, delivery, ship to address information. So all those fields, all those tables I can pull in and set a price lists off of those off of that data so a very powerful tool um, just kind of want to explain how that works and how extra uses these price lists so pretty flexible pretty powerful uh, pretty tool in x3 so that is a kind of an overview of order processing within x3 thanks for watching the sales flow overview in sage x3